human sex drive, especially in the male of the species, is a fascinating subject. In other animals their need to procreate comes from a primal urge to continue their species and particularly their place in it. We humans do this also. By generating replacements for ourselves, we obtain the only form of immortality that is known. But the particular sexual appetites, or a fetish, as it is often called, is most fascinating to me. It is said that, as soon as the male child first stumbles upon feelings of arousal whatever happens to be happening at that moment, or whatever he might see or hear can then be fair for locked in his mind as his ultimate source of pleasure. This then opens a Pandora's box of possibilities in a developing mind and can have positive and negative consequences. Of course, in discussing that type of person, we are discussing here there is a tendency to think in extremes. He must have suffered some type of sexual trauma at this crucial moment which then scarred him ever since. This is true of times and is sometimes the case, but there is another school of thought that believes the gateway into a secret sexual world can be much more innocent. Myself for instance. I was never the victim of sexual abuse. I was never, for the most part, the object of any form of deviant sexual behavior. I was however the result of a home with the, embarrassingly cliched, weak or absent father and the overbearing, emotionally suffocating mother. As a child, I coped with this reality by creating a very detailed and very rich fantasy life. This imaginary world was just as real, if not more so, than my so-called everyday life. Around other children and adults I was shy, silent, afraid. I was terrified of confrontation and terrified of my mother's reaction to any deviation from the normal flow of life that was established as acceptable. As long as I put forth the impression that all was well then there was peace in the house. If I failed then there was a shrieking banshee in my ears that would not stop until I had made it clear that the mechanical rhythm of our life would not be interrupted again. Let me add this. My mother 75% of the time was a fun and generous parent and I'm grateful for her good qualities but I also know must acknowledge the other 25% that only I saw. It is a factor in my development. Now, as the male child might develop, along with this private world, slowly and naturally a sexual component becomes a part as it does with all children. Now to the intensely private and secretive child this can create a dilemma. His growing sexuality he might not regard as shameful, but his intense desire not to share it with what he has always found a cold and remote world might be. Bondage also can be a strong component and not even hardcore. When Ted Bundy was arrested for the last time in Florida the only literature that could even remotely be considered porn was a catalog for preteen girls for cheerleader outfits. Often it is the pictures in one's mind that should cause concern. The physical photographs are just a small piece to the melodrama being carried out around. My point being this. As I grew so did my appetites. Approaching young adulthood I was well immersed, not just in a private world, another galaxy. Along the way I had decided the outside world had never offered anything but rejection and scorn. So I was not about to share my most secret thoughts with it. Long ago I decided that, although I must inhabit and take part at times in the daylight world, access to my nighttime activity was prohibited to all but myself. Lines had already been crossed to which there was no return. My revelation at 15 that to substitute a real girl in my fantasies in place of a toy was profound moment but also, in my haste and immature execution, almost a fatal one. This is where the entity comes in. I call it an entity but it doesn't really matter the name. It is so much more than that. It has been with me since I was a child. It grew with me as my interests mirrored its own, and vice versa, but it wasn't until my nearly hemicidal blunder at 15 that it asserted itself. You see it needs me to stay, hidden and it needs me to feed. Since my needs are similar we came to an agreement, not unlike the classic vampire stories. During the day when I must take control for our Sokka I guard it while it sleeps. This serves to maintain an acceptable appearance which then makes it easier to live our true life. When the entity rises, it is then time for it to fulfill its part of our agreement. In return for my protection it allows me to hunt and feed on what I need most which, of course is also what it needs too. The protective nature one develops for this misunderstood creature is very much paternal. To those who might wish it harm for its supposed crimes, I would say it never asked to be. It only hunts when the need is unbearable and it is never greedy. It only takes what it needs with as little unnecessary pain to its prey as can be possibly expected. The logic it hears echoing in itself is a meant to justify while at the same time acknowledge the randomness of itself and the world it inhabits is that people disappear every day. People disappear every day. People disappear every day.